will look after you. By Robin Klein It wasn't a particularly dramatic accident. The car just skidded in gravel, tipped neatly off the road, and slid a little way down the mountainside, coming to rest in thick scrub. But Ambrose Fennel struck his head against the dashboard and lost consciousness. When he woke up, he found himself in bed with a pounding forehead and both arms bandaged from fingers to elbows. There was a cradle arrangement under the bedclothes and his right leg seemed to be constricted in heavy strapping and a splint. Ambrose was the sort of person who couldn't bear illness or injury. Even with a cut finger, he always half shut his eyes while he dabbed on antiseptic. So now he flinched in appalled horror at his terrible injuries and the realization that he must be in hospital. Even though the room didn't look much like a hospital ward. Hospital beds weren't usually old fashioned brass ones with crocheted woolen bedspreads. There didn't seem to be any buzzer to summon assistance either. Hey, he called feebly. Anyone around? Would someone please? <sighs> it took several calls and he was outraged that he should have even be left unattended with such injuries. He prepared some cutting remarks about antiquated country nursing homes and their equally inefficient staff. But when the middle-aged woman came into the room, he found her rather intimidating and didn't utter any of them. She was tall and strong-looking, in spite of her grey hair, and a thorough bossy boot judging by the brisk way she pushed his head firmly back on the pillows and tucked his arms under the blanket. You must lie still and keep very quiet, young man, she said. That leg of yours is fractured, you know, and both arms have shocking abrasions. My word, you were lucky all the same. No one ever uses that mountain road, so you could have been trapped there in your car forever, and not a soul knowing. It's fortunate that we just happened to hear the sound of the crash and went to investigate. I took that road by mistake, Ambrose explained groggily. The pain lurking about behind his forehead confused him. It was difficult to remember things clearly. I, I didn't know it was in such bad condition and so dangerous. There should be a, a warning notice at the turn off down the, by the highway. There is a notice, but it got blown over in the wind. Mavis went down the mountain to check, and she's put the bars back again, so nobody else will make the same mistake. Mavis? She's my daughter, and you'll meet her by and by. My name's Mrs. Burbage, and there's just the two of us here. Mavis and me. Three of us now, counting you. You don't have to worry. We've set that leg of yours nicely and attended to your poor arms. Just lie there quietly like a good boy and let time do the healing with Mavis and I helping it along, of course. Mrs. Burbage, 
Ambrose cried, horrified. With all due respect, a broken leg needs professional attention. I'm sure you've most done your best and I'm extremely grateful, but now you must telephone for a doctor. Call an ambulance. Oh no, dear. I can't do that. We don't have the telephone at all, you see. We don't have a car, either. And I'm afraid yours can't possibly be got back on the road, even if Mavis or me could drive. But you mustn't worry. Mustn't worry? Uh, look, you don't seem to realise... Mavis is cooking such a lovely supper for you. You'll really appreciate her cooking. I'm sure that some young man will come along some day and ask her to be his wife. All in the strength of her cooking. She drew up a chair and sat down cosily with a bag of knitting. Ambrose was devastated by her matter-of-factness. He watched her stealthily, wondering if she were in fact simple-minded. The daughter, Mavis, he thought with relief, she's probably organised an ambulance to come up here to fetch me, but couldn't get it across to her dim-witted old mum. Any minute now, an ambulance will turn up. What are you knitting, Mrs. Burbage? he asked, smiling politely at the poor, silly old thing. I've just cast on the first row of a pullover. I hope you like this colour, because it's going to be for you, my dear. I've had this wool set for a, ever such a long time, but it's still as good as new. That's really kind of you. Perhaps I'll be driving along this way again sometime, and I'll certainly call in to say hello, and collect the sweater. I've never had a uh, sweater hand-knitted especially for me before. Best to humour her. I don't suppose any of the young ladies you know ever bother to learn how to knit? I don't have much time for modern girls myself. Young hussies, a lot of them. Tinting their hair and wearing indecent clothes. It's not nice at all. My Mavis has been raised very differently, living up here right away from bad influences. Of course, I'd be the first to admit she's not a beauty. But looks aren't everything. She's refined and ladylike and wholesome. And that's what counts in a girl of, of marrying age. Wouldn't you agree? But you'll see for yourself when she brings supper. I'm looking forward to meeting her, Ambrose said fervently, wanted to know just when the ambulance would arrive. Mavis, of course, would have that well in hand. She must be quite capable if she had to deal with such a peculiar old mother every day. But when the girl came into the room with a tray, Ambrose looked at her and felt uneasy. He had expected an enterprising, self-sufficient country girl. But Mavis was so shy she couldn't even meet his eyes. She was homely to the point of ugliness, with blurred features, like the contours of a badly printed topographic map. He even felt quite sorry for her, despite his own rising worries. Did you send for an ambulance? He whispered as she set down the tray. But she blushed scarlet and shook her head. My God, they're both dim-witted, he thought. Look here, he said severely. I'm very grateful that you got me out of the car and applied first aid, but I insist that one of you go and notify a neighbour immediately. Can't you see? With horrific injuries like this, first aid isn't just going to be sufficient. I need a doctor. Somehow you've got to get me to a doctor. I'll fetch one up here. 
But we can't do that, Mrs. Burbage said gently. We haven't got the telephone, as I told you before. Not to mention having no car. Oops, careful, dear. Don't try to hold the cup with your arms in the state they are. Let Mavis give you a little sips and spoonfuls. Hmm, delicious, isn't it? No one can make vegetable soup like Mavis. What was I saying? Oh, yes, we hardly ever go out, so we don't have any need of a car. Surely you have some arrangement for shopping. Oh, we're almost self-sufficient here with the veggie garden and the fowls. We've got a standing order for the few groceries we need. And every couple of months, they leave a carton in a special place down by, by the highway. I walk down to fetch it up. I'm very strong for my age. But we just got our grocery delivery yesterday. So the van won't be coming out this way again for ever so long. Well then, you could walk to the nearest neighbour. Or send Mavis. But we haven't got any neighbours. Not for miles and miles and miles. Besides, I wouldn't let Mavis go strolling about by herself after dark. She's been very carefully brought up. Even though we do live here all by ourselves, on top of this deserted mountain. Now, after that nice soup, there's some lovely wine trifle. Ambrose struggled to make his request composed and firm, as though instructing a pair of children. But his voice seemed to be coming from the far end of a long tunnel. Both of you could walk, must walk down to the main road and wait for a passing motorist. Take a torch with you and wave them down. Give them your address and then tell them to drive as fast as possible to the nearest phone and ask for an ambulance to be sent up here. With a doctor. Oh, but you don't need a doctor, dear. We did all that was necessary. We set your poor broken leg and put ointment on your lacerations. And now we're going to nurse you back to health. Aren't we, Mavis? Mavis nodded and smiled moistly, showing all her gums. She had a terrible smile. Poor, unfortunate girl. Ambrose looked quickly away from the jackal grin shuddering. You mustn't think it's any trouble for us either, Mrs. Burbage said. Why, we're going to love having such a handsome young man around the house. All you have to do is lie there and be patient and quiet. We'll look after you. Don't you think we made a beautiful job of those bandages? Ambrose inspected his bandaged arms and was filled with new worries. Infection, he thought giddily. I could get some dreadful infection and need antibiotics. Perhaps even a skin graft. And painkillers. In proper hospitals they'd give, be giving me a course of injections to stop the pain after injuries like this. Although he could feel no pain now. That was probably because he was still in shock. Being in shock was dangerous. A condition needed skilled medical care, and even if the shock abated, pain would eventually rush in to engulf him. Although he could feel now, though was a vast tiredness that spread through his body. When I don't turn up at the Lushams, they'll start to wonder, he thought. They'll notify the police, and there'll be a search. Only a matter of holding out till... Hadn't there been a letter? Hadn't he, after all, decided not to go on that camping trip? He'd written to Darren and Nina saying he wanted to get right away from everything before he started looking around for a new job. Just driving around from place to place, 
not sure where he'd be in touch sometime. No workmates now to miss him and make inquiries. No family and his flat. He didn't even know any of the neighbours there. And was away so often they probably wouldn't even... Wouldn't... That's right, dear, said Mrs. Burbage, pulling the sheet up under his chin. You go back to sleep, and don't you fret about a thing. We'll take the very best care of you. He coasted in and out of sleep, losing track of time. Whenever he wakened, Mrs. Burbage seemed to be knitting placidly by his bedside, and Mavis bringing another meal on a tray. As soon as he opened his eyes, Mrs. Burbage would pause in her knitting to boast to him about her daughter. She's such a jewel, the voice murmured at him. You will have noticed, of course, that she's a bit shy, but I think that's rather sweet in a young girl myself. Shy because she doesn't think she's very pretty, but I keep telling her, beauty is as beauty does. Mavis, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. One day some lovely young man is going to come along and really appreciate you for your sweet old-fashioned qualities. My word, she certainly has taken a liking to you. See how nicely she's ironed your shirt and trousers and jacket, all ready for you to step back into when we finish nursing you back to health. Yes, she's really done them beautifully. A labour of love. They're spruce enough to wear to a wedding. Mrs. Burbage's voice bumbled about inside his mind. He braced his body, expecting pain every time he moved. But there was no pain. He just felt slow and muddled and craved sleep continually. Drugs, he thought suddenly. They're doping me with something in their damned food. When the next tray came, he shook his head. I'm not hungry, Mavis. He told the girl and closed his eyes and pretended to be drifting back to sleep. But Mavis made you such a li nice little baked custard, Mrs. Burbage said. She made it specially for you. That's very kind, but just leave the tray by the bed. I'll try to eat it later. And I don't mean to sound rude, but do you mind not sitting there by the bedside quite so much? The knitting distracts me. I need quiet. Of course, dear. You should have told me before. We only want to take the best possible care of you. Anything you want, you only have to ask. When they left the room, he sniffled at the custard suspiciously. It didn't look odd, and smelled blandly of milk and nutmeg. But he was sure it was drugged. He looked helplessly at the cradle over his splinted leg and at his bandaged arms. Firm, neat bandaging. But surely dressings were supposed to be changed every day. Had Mrs. Burbage and Mavis removed the original bandages at all yet? He couldn't remember them doing so. Couldn't even remember how long he'd been lying here in this wretched bed. Should he call them back and ask? Those wounds could become infected if the dressings weren't changed. But he couldn't bear the thought of Mavis and her mother leaning over his bed, unrolling the bandages to check. He'd do it himself, distasteful though it would be. He found the end of the bandage on his left arm, pulled it loose with his teeth and clumsily unwound it. 
Then he forced his apprehensive eyes to look at the bared skin. The horribly lacerated skin. The arm was smooth and unmarked. He ripped the bandage from his other arm and that too was perfectly normal and undamaged. He shifted his splinted leg experimentally under the blanket. It felt cramped and uncomfortable, but he could bend his toes, rotate his foot and flex his knee without discomfort. That leg, he thought furiously, wasn't even broken at all, and never had been. Nursing him back to health indeed. He'd have them both arrested for abduction and fraud and keeping him here against his will. He heard footsteps and quickly pushed the loose bandages and his bare arms out of sight under the blankets. Mavis made you a nice cup of cocoa, said Mrs. Burbage. Thank you, Mavis. I'll drink it when it cools down a little. By the way, when can I get out of bed? He asked casually. I feel much better, you know, and I can't inconvenience you two ladies much longer. Oh, but broken legs take several weeks to mend, dear. And then there's your poor gashed arms. You can't rush these things. And you mustn't feel for one minute it's a bother to us. Mavis just adores cooking special little treats for you. I was only saying to her just now in the kitchen. What a shame you never meet any nice young fellows, Mavis. It's about time you got engaged, really. Or even married. Behind her back, Mavis simpered coyly. She had, he noticed, taken to wearing a battered silk flower pin to her lank hair. I've suddenly realised... What a sweet looking young couple you make, Mrs. Burbage said, beaming. If I was superstitious, I'd say it was fate brought you both together. Mavis smirked. We've got a special little treat all lined up, Mrs. Burbage said. Mavis is going to sing for you. You didn't know she could sing, did you? There are such a lot of things Mavis can do. She's very accomplished. I raised her nicely so she could make an excellent wife for some fortunate young man. I keep telling her, don't despair, even if we do live in an out-of-way spot. There's still a chance that one day Mr. Wright will turn up like a knight in shining armour. You can't go against fate. I'm sure she'll meet someone one day, Ambrose said hurriedly. And yes, I'd certainly like to listen to her sing. Only, you don't mind if she sings in another room, do you? My head aches and I'm so very weak and sensitive to noise. That's all right. We'll just go up the hall to the lounge room and leave the doors open so you can hear, said Mrs. Burbage. I'll need her to turn the pages of the music for me at the piano, anyhow. Ambrose waited for the first sounds from the piano, then freed his leg. He worked at a hectic, urgent speed, though he felt giddy from his stay in bed. His imprisonment in bed. He swung his legs to the floor and rubbed frantically to bring back the circulation. Mavis was singing something about a girl waiting at the slip rails for her long-lost lover. She finished, and Ambrose called out loudly, That was very charming, Mavis! Please, don't stop! Sing something else! Sing all the songs you know! There's nothing I enjoy more than listening to nice long ballads! He pulled on his clothes, climbed out of the bedroom window, and ran across a patch of untented lawn to the road. He reeled down the road feeling stiff and light-headed, with an eerie sensation creeping out between his shoulder blades. 
Evening was falling across the mountainside, and he almost passed his car without seeing it. It was doubtful that anyone else passing by would notice it either. Someone had brushed away any skid marks and covered the vehicle with branches and bracken. No use even climbing down to check the damage. It was obvious that a tow truck would be needed to hoist it back onto the road. He tried to recall just how far away the main highway was, hazily remembering bend after bend of this narrow, twisting road with no safe place to turn once he realised he'd made a mistake. Driving and driving, completely lost. There was probably a long walk ahead. He stumbled on, looking nervously over his shoulder, not even stopping to tie his shoelaces. By now, they would have gone into the bedroom to find out why he hadn't called out for, to ask for more music. Found the open window, and the discarded bandages, and his clothes gone. Mavis, he shouldn't wonder, would be terribly upset, and her mother. Perhaps they'd even follow him down the darkening road. He broke into a panicky run, his feet scuffling about in loose stones, eyes watching his flight like cats watching a maimed bird. He darted, scared glances, over his shoulder as he fled, fancying that he saw shadows moving secretively after him some way back. Indistinct shapes, a pale shimmer that could have been an apron, something bobbing about that was perhaps an artificial flower pinned to hair. Go back! Go back to your own house! Leave me alone! He yelled at the shadows, then tripped and pitched Heavily forward, he flung out an arm to break the agonizingly painful fall. Pain slammed at him as he tried to claw his way back onto his feet. But his leg, his injured, terribly injured leg, pinned him to the road surface as though he were a butterfly fastened to a board. He cradled his head in his arms and wept with pain. There, there, a voice murmured as hands tenderly stroked his sweat-dampened hair. What a foolish young man, running down the mountainside in the twilight on such a steep, dangerous road. Why, you silly boy, you've gone and broken your other leg now. My word is going to need a lot of nursing to get you shipshape again. Don't look so upset, dear. We can easily get you back to the house. It's no trouble at all. You don't mind having to look after you? Do we, Mavis?